Now recording. Class shall now commence. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? Um, you know, a little bit tired, but it is what it is. Um, yeah. When you become a parent, you find out that you really don't need as much sleep as you think you did to be like kind of barely functional, you know? But uh, yeah, it was a bit of a rough night last night. That's okay. So, <clears throat> we have this one teensy weensy little topic to cover in week three, and then we will be on to week four, the meat of the matter for assignment one, the stuff we haven't covered yet that you need to do assignment one. So, shall we get to it? Shall we get cracking? Any questions before we begin from anybody on anything for any reason? Topics relating to the course? Topics not related to the course? Any philosophical questions? Yes? So, a while ago, you were talking about how AI stuff is mostly using Python. Is that you? Is that correct? Um, but I was talking, like, a lot of machine learning, um, a lot of people who do machine learning, um, the language that they use for that work a lot of the time is Python. Now, the libraries that Python is using to do this kind of stuff, if they were written in Python, then you wouldn't have enough efficiency. Python is most of the time the front end for a lot of C++ libraries. You find similar things in like image processing libraries and that sort of thing. The, the follow-up I had to that. Yes. Um, so AI stuff is like exceptionally expensive in terms of power. Um, well, yeah, in terms of like just the raw number of. Okay. I can get into it just a little bit before we get into this. All right. So. What's really expensive about um, machine learning, I'm going to talk about machine learning. Generative AI is a, um, it's a subcategory of machine learning algorithms, right? Um, what machine learning is trying to do, fundamentally, is it's, you take a set of data, right, a set of labeled data, right? You, uh, you allow the computer to come up with hypotheses of how the input relates to the output. Then you test those hypotheses to see how accurate they are. You keep the most accurate, accurate ones. Once you have a set of accurate hypotheses, which are completely un... we can't understand, like human beings cannot look into like a neural net and see what's going on. It's too complicated. Um, once you have the neural net, though, um, you can run it on relatively inefficient or relatively low-end hardware. Um, this is how you know there are various like versions of the chatbot or you know image AI things like Dolly that you can have and run locally on your own computer. GPU, uh, GPU helps to accelerate it, but it's feasible, right? It's because the major expense is in the training. That's what takes all the time. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. I was actually, um, I was watching an interesting computer file video um, uh, the other day. Anybody aware, of, have I talked about computer file, the, the uh, YouTube channel? Yeah. It's, um, there's this, this interesting video that came out uh, on Computer File recently talking about a paper that was published um, by, I forget who, from University of somewhere or something. Um, but uh, basically, it was talking about whether or not AI is close, close to peaking in its usefulness. Right? Um, so, Basically, because even generative AI is just a, um, it's just 
a model that's been developed from training data, right? The idea that people, like the optimistic view of AI, pessim pessimistic for human beings, but optimistic for robots, is that um, if you examine, like, the, if, if you have a graph here and you have, like, usefulness of the, uh, of the, you know, AI system versus um, size of training data, the thing that, uh, the thing that people who are optimistic about AI think is that you will, you will have this sort of initial phase where, you know, things are moving along reasonably, then things will start to accelerate, and things will kind of just explode off to infinity, right? That's what people who think the, sim the uh, singularity is imminent, that's, their, that's what they think that AI is doing, right? By the way, you guys all know, are you familiar with the, uh, what I mean when I say the singularity? Because yes. like, I've heard other people like, have like, conflicting definitions of it, right? When I say the singularity, I mean, Basically, artificial intelligence, which becomes capable of rewriting itself and improving on itself, um, when it starts being able to do that, it, in theory, because it hasn't happened yet, it can iterate improvements on itself faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, and faster accelerating, and you know you can go from having no Skynet one day, and then in two days suddenly Skynet's in the universe, right? This is the end, it continues its exponential growth of intelligence, you know, until it hits the physical limits of what you can do with electrons or some, something like that, right? So that's what, that's what people who are inclined to think that the singularity will be a good thing and look forward to the day when we're all ruled by machines. That's what they, that's what these people are expecting. Question? Um, about that singularity, um how, how does it know that 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 one is that um that, that's actually improving itself? Well, um, in theory, you can test to see. Like, you need some kind of objective metric, right? But um, we can tell when a machine learning algorithm, in general, is improving itself because this is what you do. This is how you test to see if a machine learning algorithm is improving, is it is is better or worse, right? You take half of your data set and you train the model with that. You take the other half of the set and see how well your system predicts it, right? The classical example is pictures of cats and dogs, right? Let's say you feed into the algorithm one million pictures of cats and dogs, labeled cat, labeled dog, right? You divide that in half, so 500,000 photos, you train your system on that. The other 500,000 photos, you give the model, the picture, ask it if it's a cat or a dog, it gives you its response, you check it against the label. Right? So you can get a percent accuracy rate um, that way uh, on, a, on a machine learning system. Does that make sense? Thanks, yeah. That's a good question. Um, so, you know, uh, question at back. Yeah, no, I just want to add on that. The other, the other problem is that when, you, when they do stuff like that, it's usually like high torque or sensor flow. Yeah. No one knows exactly what it's using to detect the difference between the two, so it can look like it's correct, and it's like 99% accuracy. Yes. But then by per chance, there, every cat photo has more of, say, this pixel color than the dog photo. Yes. And it's just checking that. So when you compare a cat to like a brick, it's going to think they're all bricks. <laughs> yes, that is, um, that is very, very good to bring up. That is called... Um, uh, training data bias. So if there's any kind of like weird bias in your training data, it's very likely that's going to be picked up by your machine learning model. Normally, the solution to this has been to increase the size of the training data. But, you know. So, this is the optimist's view. Right? The um, sort of adult in the room view, I guess you could say, is that, well, you know, it's probably something like a linear relationship. You put more in, you get more out. 
that type of thing, right? So this is like, you know, the uninvested view. And then you have the pessimist's view. Instead of the usefulness of artificial intelligence increasing exponentially on the size of the training data, uh, which, by the way, this view is founded on the idea that, you know, if you feed a machine learning algorithm a sufficient number of pictures of, of cats and dogs and it learns to distinguish between those two, eventually it will learn how to distinguish an elephant, right? It sounds silly, but that's actually what people expect to happen with, for example, the, um, like the large language models. That is what they're actually expecting to happen. Right? That somehow the machine will just be able to fully simulate human language and be able to solve novel problems. Right? Um, this, like, this is basically how many novel problems that do not occur in the training data do you expect it to be able to solve? Right? Yes? Um, what if you deliberately mislabel the data you give it? Just that poisoning the well. Um, there's. Uh, so you remember um, there's this uh, Microsoft had this chat bot yes. like a number of years ago that like um, the uh, the frogs online managed to turn into a neo Nazi. Yeah, I was about to say they turned yeah. into like anime and to like do like like Hitler stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. You can you can absolutely you can absolutely get something undesirable by uh, by uh, you know shall we say modifying the training data. Um, actually, I have another interesting story about that after this one. But, um, so then we have the pessimist's view. If the optimist's view is that usefulness is exponential on the training data, give me one second. Yep, the pessimist's view is that the usefulness is logarithmic on the training data, right? Pessimist. Yes, sir. So as a pessimist, I would like to say that I think that's true, especially because it's only using like linear algebra and math, mathematical values for whatever it's talking about mm -hmm. to figure things out. Like the easiest way thing that people talk about online is like strawberry, where they have to like hard code a patch to maybe check the R's in strawberry. But if you spell it wrong and you ask him what the word is and mm -hmm. you know how many of the letters are in it, it can still get it wrong. So yeah. It's very simple. Well, the other and thing. You can change yeah. how it's actually processing the data that it's getting before we see a huge jump. Because mm -hmm. right now I think it's more so just a above average Google search than like, well, sentient. Yes. Um, let, me, let me tell you the re uh, what this paper said. Right? Because the paper agrees with you. Uh, right? So, and this is like current state of the art research in computer science, um, this paper. Right? Like, a lot of scientific papers are marketing hype, believe it or not, right? A lot of papers are like, ooh, we're at the advent of general artificial intelligence. And other papers do the math, right? So here's the problem. The usefulness of, the, like, if you actually measure the usefulness of AI as you increase the size of the training data, it's doing more of this than this or this. And there's a reason for that. It has to do with the frequency of the occurrence of specific information inside of labeled training data. Right? So imagine it this way, right? Let's, have, let's have say, just for the sake of argument, that you want your image recognition algorithm to recognize t uh, trees. Now imagine all of the all of the um, images of trees on the internet that they're using to train it. How many are labeled with the specific type of tree in the photograph? Versus this is a tree, right? Like it might be fine for like this photo contains a puppy, but if you're asking what kind of puppy, like what breed of puppy is in this picture, that information is far less frequent, orders of magnitude less frequent in the training data than in, uh, the, you know, than in than the, the, the less, the more generic information. So 
basically, what ends up happening is usefulness is correlated to how specific it can get. Right? In order to get more specific, it needs more specific training data. The more specific training data is much less frequent than the general training data. Therefore, you know, going from say one billion pieces of, or zero, going from one billion pieces of information in the training data to two billion pieces of information in the training data, that will get you like so far in usefulness because you're you're tracking more general information. But to get more specific information, you basically have to keep doubling the amount of training data that you feed into this thing. And what's the expensive part? Processing all the data. Processing all the training data and training the model. So basically, it's the position. It's you can sort of extrapolate from this paper if you just you know use common sense that at a certain point we will hit we'll hit a plateau because it will become so expensive to improve the model by 1% that it's there's not going to be a business case for it the the model that we have will be good enough and we can't improve it without breaking the bank right so um, you know, there, I, I've heard there's a, a fairly good improvement between uh, GPT-3 and 4. Personally, I haven't played with it. But you, you can imagine, like, like, think about it this way, right? How much improvement was there between the iPhone 1 and the iPhone 2? Quite a lot. Well, oh. relative to the difference between, like, the 11 and the 12. Okay. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Right? But, yeah. That's, that's, that's what we're kind of talking about. In order to have something like this, right, there would have to be some kind of like qualitative leap in the algorithms being used. You can only achieve so much with a specific algorithm, right? And like fortunately, it seems like all of the, uh, all of the people who imagined that artificial intelligence would explode and replace all human beings in jobs. Um, I think we're still going to have jobs for a little while longer. Um, so, good. I like that. Yes? Okay, I'm going to rapid fire a few things. One, okay. they initially said the same thing about Visual Basic when that came out, the uh, macroing for uh, Excel, that that would replace all programming jobs. They've um, said that a lot about a lot of things I, in I, history, I, yeah. Two, two, the thing you're also talking about, there's like this graph here, it's called, it's called, it, it's in terms of uh, technological innovation, it always looks like this. Like this up, it's like a ladder, like a step ladder. Yeah. And it goes like this, and then it tapers and goes like this. And yeah, yeah. Uh, the third thing is about the uh, ChatGPT is their newest model is literally with, with some improvements. It just reprompts into itself, so it looks like it's really thinking a lot, but it's just doing more per search. And the last thing I'd say is when G GPT two came out, the CEO said that it should be regulated because he's trying to generate hype that this thing was like so good. That it was basically like uh, AGI. Also, that that's yeah. another that's a sneaky move that corporations do to try to lock out competition. Establish establish a monopoly, basically. Monopoly yeah. Position and then regulate the competition so they can't get those. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so don't believe the hype. Um, there is an immutable law of the universe, and that is, if you don't put any effort in, you don't get anything of consequence. That is an immutable law of the universe, and GPT has not broken it. Not so far. So, anyway, how long did I spend talking about AI? Goodness gracious. Um, all right. So, still, topic of interest. You know. Don't ask me how Bitcoin works today. We'll, we'll, talk, about that. we'll talk about that another time. Um, <clears throat> So, let's talk design patterns. Yay! This is just a short little blast. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a design topic that we're going to be revisiting throughout the course as we go through the course. Eventually, we will work our way up to actual working frigging examples of, well, miniaturized working examples of this architecture. But, Everybody uh, who took Java, everybody who took Java, good. 
Um, everybody else is sleeping. I'm pretty sure you haven't passed Java to get here in the first place. Um, everybody who took Java will remember the model versus view distinction, right? In our web architecture brains, so far, what is the model? Oh, it's like the thing that actually does all the thinking. The yeah, but in a web when a, in a web app, what is the model? In a web app, wouldn't that be like the HTML? Yeah, uh, not the HTML, the back end. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the back end is all of the data logic that's you know <laughs> servicing the data, how you interact with the data. If that data isn't a database or not, it's still the data, right? Um, what is the view? The front end. The front end, yes. So, to model and view, we add controller. MVC. Yes, MVC stands for model view controller. So, the purpose of the controller is to, uh, in a web architecture context, is to handle all of these um, little bits and pieces of packet routing, deciding which view should be viewed given the inputs. Um, all, like when the pot, when a packet hits a server that has been configured with model view controller architecture, the first thing it hits is the controller. The controller goes out, finds a view, does the model logic, populates the view with the data that it needs to have, and then the controller kicks that back out to the client. Does that make sense? There are a lot of like different individual techniques that are used, like hard programming technique, not hard as in difficult, but hard as in like concrete and static. Uh, programming techniques that are used to, um, to implement a model view controller architecture, some of which we will uh, talk about, briefly at least. Um, one, of the, one of them is a template array. Excuse me. Um, all of this is stuff that we will be, uh, we'll be doing examples of a little bit further on once we have, like, databases under our belt and we have something to work with on the data side. So, um, yes. So, model and view, please rely on Java for that. Controller, the controller acts as an intermediary between the model and the view. It processes user input, interprets commands, and decides what actions to take. Handles the flow of data between the model and the view and ensures that user requests are appropriately processed. By separating an application into these three components, MVC promotes a structured and organized approach to web development. It enhances code modularity, making it easier to manage and update each component independently. Additionally, MVC allows uh, developers to focus on specific aspects of an application, leading to more efficient development and maintenance. The other big, um, one thing. The other big thing about model view controller is that many frameworks, such as Laravel, which you will study if you take advanced PHP, um, it uses MVC architecture. The C in MVC is often boilerplate code. So most of the controller can actually be taken off your plate if you use a framework. You had a question? Yeah, what kind of uh, languages are you uh, the same language as, uh, like in our case, it's PHP, PHP, PHP. Cool. Yeah. Um, you know, the controller is written in PHP. The um, the model is PHP, which talks to a database using SQL, so there'll be some SQL in there. And then the view is one is going to be like one of these PHP one page app with HTML sprinkled in, or perhaps HTML with PHP sprinkled in. Um, one of those, that'll be a view. Does that make sense? Yeah. Question? Yeah, so in this case, controller would be an API that like, connects back and front end? Um, it does a bit more than just be the API. Um, it 
is deciding like what parts of the model and what like like yes, but it does a bit more than that. But in general, yes, the controller implements the API. Like the API itself is like like you can put an API on a piece of paper. The API is not the code that implements the API. But yes, it's you're like 95%. I'm, 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 really, I'm really struggling with the 5% that I want to bring that into. But anyway, yes, you're correct. <laughs> you're sufficiently correct. <laughs> um, any questions? Hopefully, hopefully. So, um, there's a quick reference sheet in this week's stuff. Um, please use it uh, as you need to. Um, there are a couple of functions, global functions, uh, here which uh, you may find useful. For example, um, rand does a random number. Um, variable dump prints the type and contents of a variable. I always use like JSON in code because normally it's, you know, yeah. Um, number format is a rounding operation. Um, mail, haha, you can send emails in PHP, um, but only if the server is configured to do so, which, you know, it may or may not be. Probably not on your accounts on CS Unix. Sorry, guys. But uh, yeah, if you wonder where spam comes from, there you go. Actually, you can send, you can send emails in, from like Python as well. Yeah, it's possible. <coughs> So, good. So, let's move right along to, um, I'm going to skip that, skip, skip, skip. Okay, so, when it's time for the test and everybody's bothering me about practice questions, all right, here are your practice questions. There's a whole list of them right here in the weekly exercises, please do as many of these as is necessary for you to solidify the concepts. Okie dokie? Cool. Um, but, hey, what? When clear tests, do you provide syntax sheets for anything? Or no? um, yeah, I can provide a syntax sheet. Because, like, it's pretty solid that we have to echo stuff for HTML. I'm probably going to forget. Yeah, I think that like, like I generally do one of two things, right? It's either a crib sheet or a syntax reference sheet that's provided. Um, I think this semester I'm going to provide, I'm going to prefer a provided syntax reference sheet. So, yeah. But like the test is like more than a month from now. Come on, man. I'm not thinking about the test. Why are you guys thinking about well, the test? Well, if we prepare now, it's better that we prepare in a month, right? You know, when people tell me about, like, oh, man, the exam, the exam, I gotta study, I gotta study, you know, uh, the thing that I usually say to people is, you know, the best preparation for the exam is the course. <laughs> so if you do the course, while we're doing the course, that's the best preparation for the exam. But you should still study for the exam. I'm not saying don't study. <coughs> so, moving right along. <coughs> arrays. I want arrays. Ha ha ha. You want another joke with the same punchline? Sure. Yes. Why did the programmer quit his job? He didn't get a raise. He didn't get a raise. <laughs> hey. So. So, PHP says it has a raise, but it's lying. PHP has lists. These are not arrays, these are lists. 
Uh, if you are familiar with the difference between arrays and lists, these are lists. Um, arrays must be monotyped. Lists can have multiple types within them. So th these are lists, but PHP calls them arrays erroneously. But we're going to call them arrays too because that's what the function is called. So, um, empty arrays can be constructed either with the array function or with square bracket notation, which, believe it or not, was only introduced to PHP in version 5.4, which is relatively recently. Arrays can have integer or string index values. That is another way of saying we have arrays classic, and then we have what are called associative arrays. So, um, if everybody could please open up XAMPP and VS Code. Yes, sir. Okay. Just, just to clarify, when you say types, you mean data types, correct? Yes. Okay. What other type would there be? I'm not sure yet, but I'm not sure yet. I, I, I just want just, I just like, like, like clarity. Sure. Yep, I'm talking about data types. up my HT docs. Opening up my HT docs. Beep, bop. Nope, that's not it. Wait, yes it is. Oh, XAMPP has to be running. Start! Oh, HT docs, there we go. Okay, I am in HT docs. Okay, new <laughs> folder. We I guess this is, we're in week three, but this is week four material. So, there we go. <coughs> Do I trust myself? Yes. yes. Should I trust myself? No. That's another question. Let's make a new file and call it examples.php. So, Pace. All right. PHP. Computers. There we go. So, in our PHP code today, we are going to be trying out arrays. Um, I don't know why you would use the array function if you have square brace notation available, since that's the way everybody else does it. Once again, if you can find a way of doing things the same way that Java or a different language does them, you should probably do that. So, <coughs> let's say we have an array which is empty. There we go. Empty array declared. Array 2 containing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There we go. So this is... Oh, um... Do you want me to uh, kill the lights a bit more? Yeah. Oh, I can also put the thing in high contrast mode. Here. Good. 
This isn't helpful at all. Yeah, I think these are in settings. Settings? File settings? Yeah, like the... Your Preferences? Oh, maybe. Settings? Oh, search. Um, theme? No, color theme. Dark high contrast. Better. And I will also kill the lights. And that's about as good as I can make it, unfortunately. The projector is really dim in this room. Okay. So, this is an array. The preferred way to print an array is not to just echo it. Let's see what that does. Echo array 2. I'm going to close the door. JSON from JavaScript, even a little bit. So what JSON is, is it's a way of encoding an object as a string, uh, you know, objects and arrays. Fortunately, in JavaScript, um, the JSON format is actually what you use to construct it in the language itself. But if you take that string and you save it to a file, then it becomes a JSON file. So, we send JSON data by using the JSON encode function. This takes our data object in PHP, constructs a string correctly, and then picks it out in the response packet. When I say constructs the string correctly, another term for this is pretty printing. A less commonly used term for it. And there you can see our array is output in the manner we have come to expect. Let's just throw a break in there. There we have it. So, Arrays classic work basically the way you should expect them to, um, with the possible exception of don't do that. <laughs> this will not work. Right? Interestingly, it's not tripping a warning, but this is not concatenation. That is arithmetic addition in PHP. So let's see if dot works. Nope. Not even slightly. Concatenation using dot is only for strings. So the question you might have is, how do I get the six in there? Exclamation point? Exclamation point in the middle? Yeah. So array not six. Syntax error. So, are you trying to just append the six? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's tough. You just you do like when you normally declare an array, like you do like when I, I can't read that part from the So say you do temporary and then you do the square brackets equals and then you put the six there and it'll just append it to the end. Sorry, what's what you so say? If you make if you have your array right. and you're trying to append something, if you save the array and then you put a square bracket equals six, is that what you're doing? It'll put six at the end. Equals six. Yeah, so if you do if you do the array, yep. whatever, whatever your array is, like, oh, so say it's a new one, because I can't see that part, right? So if you do, here. I can't see like this. How about you just, no, like, no, 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 if you do, if you did this, 
See this, right? Yeah. That one. That one.
Does that make sense? This is an extremely useful way to think about things. As it turns out, a regular array is one of these as well. The only... Whoops. Wow, that had some travel. Marker cap. Come back here. Blah. So, you'll thank me for telling you this when you hit data structures and algorithms. A, an array, such as, you know, let me make one up. B array, oh, that other light went out. Spooky. Let's say we have the array 101, 73, 49, 66, 32. So these five elements, right? This thing is a mapping as well. We can guess what it maps into, right? This set of numbers here. What is it mapping from? Any guesses? Index. So the first item would be zero. Very good. Indexes. And what are indexes in mathematical terms? Uh, maybe a key to be known the specific data. Um, let me refine my question. If you took the indexes, those sync up with a set of numbers in more pure mathematics. Do you know what that set of numbers is? Yes. Hmm? Zero, zero, zero. Zero. Zero to an infinity. Does anybody know what the name of it is? Yes? Are those vectors? Not vectors. Not the, the natural numbers. There we go. So this is a mapping from the natural numbers to the set of elements of the array. 73, 49, 66, and 32. Now, this will become interesting to you once you hit uh, algorithms because it's very useful to understand an array as a mapping from one number to another rather than as, oh, this is just a collection of numbers and I happen to be able to get to them through other numbers, right? Like, um, oh, I can't really get into it, unfortunately, because it's like, it's too, it would be too long a tangent, but um, just Tuck that into the back of your brain. Like, efficient algorithms think about arrays as a mapping from natural numbers to some set of numbers. Like, yes? Are the keys and the values stored in different places in memory? Um, well, it's, again, implemented as a list. So, uh, like, a kind of a searchable list. So, um, yes, they will be stored in different places in memory. At back. Are you trying to relate that to Omega notation? Is that what you're going to get at? Like, algorithm efficiency? No, no, like, the, in terms of, like, how, how you efficiently implement an algorithm, not al analyze it. All right? Okay. So, um, oh, very, 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 very quickly. Um, <laughs> let's say, just for the sake of interest, you wanted to take a set of numbers and organize them into a tree. Okay. Right? You guys know what a tree is? Like a linked list? Like a linked tree? Yeah. Well, no, no. See, this is a tree implementation in just an array without a linked list. Okay, no, I have no reason to do Okay, so, okay, this is what a tree is, all right? It's a, you get a root node at the top, and you have a bunch of root, a bunch yeah, of nodes yeah, that come down list. like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's not a linked list. Yeah, we That's have a tree. Five, five, nine, three yeah. On the yeah. yeah, you can implement a tree using linked nodes. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But you do not necessarily need to implement a tree as a series of linked nodes. Here's one okay. that's as an array. Let's say we have the natural numbers 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, 6. So um, 3 points to negative 1, because that's the root. Um, 
2 points to 3, 5 points to 3, 0 points to 2, 1 points oh. to 2, 4 points to 5, 6 points to 1. Wait, so you're using, so what you're basically saying is you're doing the same thing as a linked list, and instead of linked list pointing to like memory nodes or like a, a point you're supposed to go, you're using array positions, self values, like a matrix mm -hmm. values in an array, to point to other matrix values in an array, right? Yes! Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. We can do that. But only if you think about this as a mapping from natural numbers to, nat nat to natural numbers, right? So, you can do some pretty damn efficient stuff with this, because what's the problem with a linked list? Well, you ought to get the default oh, on the fill, depend on the fill. Precisely, yeah. Um, yeah, get the other values. Yeah, in order to find any element in a linked data structure, you must walk the structure. Right? So the amount of time to get to any place in the structure is proportional to the size of the structure. Or perhaps propor proportional to the logarithm so of the size of the structure. So that's what like O n operation. Yeah. Hmm, sorry? That would be like O n operation. Like uh, if it's if it's a linear data structure like a linked list, then you're talking big O n complexity because you have it's purport directly proportional to the size of the list. But if it's something like a binary tree, right, then you only have to worry about walking the number of levels in the tree, and that's proportional to the logarithm of the number of nodes in the tree. So log n. Yeah, that's big O log n, okay. log base two n usually for a binary tree. But um, Here's the thing about an array, folks. How much time does it look, take to look up a position in an array? Depends on the array. No, it doesn't. Well, well, are you sure? Like, wait, wait, wait. I'm sure. For every language or no? For, yeah, this is, this is kernel stuff, man. OK, with what oh, okay. again? So how much time does it take to look up any particular position in an array? Um, good example one. Yeah, it's oh. constant time. Yeah. Because an array is stored in memory at a particular address say address 800, any one of these is with a known offset from this memory address. Yeah. So if you're trying to find the fourth element, you take the memory address, you, uh, you add to it four times the bit width of the thing you're storing. So if this is integers, say, you know, uh, well, the byte width actually. So four bytes for, a, for, a, uh, for an integer, so that's actually 8, 16, that's a one-step calculation. You can dereference that address. Bam! You have your address, you, or you have your value out of the array. Look, array lookup is a constant time out operation. So this is a tree with constant time lookup. Okay. Question? <laughs> Did I repeat that? <laughs> Which part? This one? So this is a tree. Right? So if negative 1 means the root node, then if I were to translate this into a structure like that, I would have 3 at the top, 2 points to 3, so 2 points to 3, right? Um, 0 and 1 point to 2, 0 points to 2, 1 points to 2, uh, 5 points to 4, 4 is not here yet. Um, no, four, point, 4 points to 5, 5 points to 3, so this one's a 5, there, 4 is pointing to 5, 6 is pointing to 1. It's an array implementation of a tree, which is something that normally people only think of in, link, in linked list terms. So, but you don't get there unless you understand that an array is a mapping from the natural numbers into the natural numbers, if it's an integer. Or, from, well, if it's integers, it's actually a mapping from natural numbers into integers, uh, which is Z in math terms. So, does that make sense? Hopefully. All right. Should I just show you how to do the friggin' assignment now? Yeah, actually, can I ask you a question? What's that right now? Let's see. Uh, is it quick? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I actually don't understand what you mean for question one. Because question two and two two, right? They're like, okay, you do the factors, one's getting every non-factor and just shooting out HTML. Okay. The first one, how do you want this ant game to work? It just says it's like an array, and when they move, they keep each other. So I'm like, okay, what way are they moving? And like, how do you want it to function? Because I didn't understand what you wanted for the first. So one. B means black ant. 
Yeah, red means red. Blue. Blue. Black means ants are right. moving from uh, left to right. Red ants are moving from right, right to left. left. Oh. If a black ant encounters a uh, red ant, they kill each other. What happens if they encounter no ant? Then they don't die. So, do they move until they see a no ant and then they stop? No, they keep moving until they get to the other end of the array. Because your neither example and your mad example are identical. So they no, they're not. They don't, I can prove it. No, they're not. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm going to answer your question. They're not identical. Oh, it's because red's on the left side and black's on the right side. Red's on the left side, black's on the right side. Oh, okay. All right, this is actually a good question. I hope everybody's paying attention. So, in one case, we have black actually... Both of those are kind of, they, they're a little bit red herrings, they, they become this, they're, they can be simplified to this, right? Black, X, red, right? If black goes one here, red goes one here, you end up with um, X, black, red, X, these two kill each other, you're left with no ants left, both nests survive, right? On the other hand, if you had red x black, red reaches this end, attacks the, uh, black, the black anthill and destroys it, black reaches the red anthill and destroys it, you have mutually assured destruction. That's what MAD stands for, by the way, is mutually assured destruction. Thank you. Sounds good? You. Yeah. So, they're not the same. I love that, love that. Yeah, no trouble. Actually, I answered the same question from somebody else by email uh, just today, so, yeah. But aren't you glad I gave you some test cases? Yeah. <laughs> and I thought people would be like, the thing with, that would throw people off was like the phrasing of the uh, of the factors thing. I thought people would be have difficulty parsing. Like the only thing about that I will say is yeah. for question two two, I just put an extra constraint where I made sure that the start one was less than the bigger, like the end one. Yeah, I'm okay with people doing that. Oh, yeah, beyond that, I think it's well. Otherwise, you're operating on a null set, which is a trivial. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Uh, <laughs> Okay, anyway, um, arrays, associative arrays, any questions about what we're actually talking about? Okay. No, sir. No, good, okay, good, 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 good. Um, I hope everybody's having fun today. I'm having fun. Okay. So, when you have an associative array, you access the elements of it using indexing, using whatever it is that you're mapping, but whatever the key is, right? The key doesn't necessarily have to be a string, but you use strings most of the time, and that's what maps into JavaScript object notation well, so strings most of the time. Associative array at oranges will print seven because oranges are mapped to seven. What if it's uh, the other way around? If you equal seven, you print orange? No. <laughs> because seven is not a key. It is a, that actually, that's a fantastic question. That question is so fantastic, I have to get my markers again. So the question is, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna use A, B, and C here. So if we have a mapping from A, B, and C to um, one, two, and three, it is obvious that we can get from A to one, B to two, and C to three. But can we not go the other way, from 3 to C, 2 to B, and A to 1? And the answer to that is, what if it's that? Right? If
if you ha so it is a property of these um, of these um, these associative associations, these mappings, that the number of things mapped to is actual actually equal to or less than the number of keys. So A and B can both map to one. In which case, if you're saying I want to get from here to back to there, which element of the keys are you getting back to from one? It cannot be determined. It's non-deterministic. Computers hate non-determinism, so they just don't do it. <laughs> so, yes. Excellent question. Excellent question. Any other questions? Okay. I'm feeling very math today. Hopefully, you folks are feeling, feeling some math, too. Math is a state of mind. So, uh, yes, I'm supposed to be teaching. Let's see here. Um, so, this is, um, so I'm not going to talk too much about regular arrays because you already know how to use them from Java. Let us examine the unique uses of for each loops on associative arrays. Now, for an associative array, it's a little bit different than when you're using a regular array. There's no algorithm that can get you from one index to another one, right? Because it's, they're not necessarily sequential letters, they are things like red, blue, and yellow, right? Q, for example. So, it's very, very, very useful to have a language construct that will do that for you. Right? Basically, what you can do is you can extract an array of just the keys, iterate over that, but this is less work. Um, so, if you have an associative array, you can say, for each C as key, mapping to value, you can then put your line of code in, and it will run this once for everything in C. Key will become the key, value will become the value for each pair. And it'll run through the whole data structure. So, let's see how this works. For each... Um, A array as um, K, what was it, a colon? No, it was a... K gets V, there you go. Uh, by the way, this is just a small, small taste of something called pattern matching. Pattern matching can be an extremely powerful programming tool, but you need more complicated patterns. <laughs> Some languages have extremely complicated patterns, and they do most of their actual decisions via pattern matching, rather than using if statements. Stuff like that. <coughs> I'm thinking about Haskell. I'm always, somewhere in my brain, thinking about Haskell. You know, because of the Stockholm Syndrome. So, that's a joke. You guys know what Stockholm Syndrome is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. Right. Sometimes I just have to check. So, echo the fruit K, um, or shall we say, there are, are value fruits of type K. Which is kind of a very computer science-y way to say this, but you know. So if we, oh, and I, I should put a, a break statement in there. There we go. So we get, there are five fruits of type apples. There are seven fruits of type oranges. There are zero fruits of type bananas. Straightforward? Sound good? Everybody get that? Okay. Again, um, PHP, for each loops, I'm kind of a fan. I like how they work. Good, 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 good. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> so.
So this is not a revolutionary uh, topic right here. Strings are character arrays. Ooh. This is the same way that they are implemented in Java. The whole point of this section is that you can perform indexing over a string, which is again, you know, yay, you can index a string, sounds good. You can do the same thing in Python. And in Python, strings are not character arrays. Um, so I'm going to take this opportunity to talk about something completely different. Um, are you folks aware of null termination in strings, in string arrays? Or, or character arrays? No. Okay. So, most la dynamic languages will abstract these types of details away from you, but it's still the sort of thing that you should know, particularly if you ever want to program in C++ or something like that. Cap! Ugh. Caps are running away from me today. So, a string is a character array. So if I have a character array, H, E, L, L, O, exclamation point, this is how you might imagine a character array is stored uh, if you don't know about null termination. So to explain why null termination exists, we must talk about our old friend C, the C programming language. Because the libraries which everybody uses, basically the kernel itself is largely written in C. The way that C handles things is the way things are handled. Everybody else is just hiding it. So, You know in Java, where you try to write outside of an array, it'll give you an a, a array out of bounds exception? You like array out of bounds exceptions? You should, because the alternative is to not get them. Yes, so in C, if you have a segment of memory, and you accidentally attempt to write to like the next memory cell after the end of an array, it will just let you. So you can go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Woo! Boop. Now, most of the time, this is not a problem, because most of the time this will just be unused space. Sometimes, that won't be unused space. Sometimes that will be one of your variables. Sometimes that will be the start of another array. Sometimes that will be outside of the sandbox which has been given to you by the operating system. In which case, what do you cause? A segmentation fault. Yes? Yep, there's, so, in like the 90s, most of you guys are put in C, like Legend of Zelda, like Ocarina of Time, and what you just said there is they purposely, users purposely do stuff to cause a glitch. Because if they have too much stuff in the memory, expect there to only be this much. Mm -hmm. If you put things in the way, it causes other bugs to occur. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Is this also called like buffer overflow? Is that what that's? Yes. That uh, yes, buffer overflow. That's what that's called. Okay. And a buffer overflow attack is to attempt to use that to introduce, uh, to basically do a code injection. Um, there's some absolutely fascinating videos on YouTube about how, um, how people can uh, do arbitrary code execution exploits yep. in Pokemon games, yep. like and Pokemon they, Red and Blue. And, and they do it in Zelda too. Yeah. They have Ace and then they have SRM, which if they call it like stale reference manipulation, or yeah. like state reference manipulation. Yeah. The Pokemon one is a little bit more direct, though. Basically, in uh, the way that Pokemon, um, in, in the old Pokemon games, the way that you get an um, uh, arbitrary code execution glitch is you trick the, po the program pointer to, into thinking that the player's inventory or the Pokemon boxes or something are 
um, program rather than data, which it can totally do, right? Um, that way, if you, arrange, if you arrange certain items in your inventory in particular patterns, those actually code for instruction. Like, they can be interpreted as instructions, which is how you can, like, warp yourself to the end of the game and get, like, a 30-second like a th run of Pokemon. Yes. Okay, so they keep going. So they do this thing, they do this thing they call S, where they basically they drop a bomb. They yeah. do a glitch to push themselves really fast. Yeah. But there's a set, the way they set up like the actors array, mm -hmm. there must just be a certain amount of actors in an area, but they grab an actor as they're moving out of an area, which causes a bug for it not to despawn. Mm -hmm. So there's too many actors, which causes a memory leak. Yes. And then they change their look, like their looking position yeah. to then get themselves any item in the game, and then just like break the whole game. So cool. Yeah. This kind of stuff is cool. So, um, so the question is, you know, what defensive measures were taken against this by the kernel? Because obviously, it is actually useful to be able to tell where the end of an array is. You always know where the beginning of an array is because you always know the starting address. That's always the beginning. But you don't, excuse me, you don't necessarily know the end. So this is what they do. This is how strings are implemented in the kernel. You leave one extra space, and you put into that space the null character. The null character is represented by uh, uh, backslash zero. It has an ASCII value of zero. So basically it's just one byte of, like, it's one character's worth of memory that's just zero. Right? And more or less, all of the string processing algorithms in the C standard library are built to expect a string to have this thing. So if it doesn't have this thing, it will continue processing out into um, arbitrary memory and might result in a segmentation fault. It depends. A, a, like a, a blank piece of memory is actually fairly common if you like look at the state of memory at any given time, there's going to be a lot of zeros. So it's highly unlikely that if you were missing the null terminating character that you go off and cause yourself a sentimentation fault, but it is possible. It's also possible, um, because of the way that air pressure works, that all of the air molecules that keep your blood from boiling uh, could all travel instantaneously away from you all at the same time and you would just explode. That's a thing that's physically possible. Just highly, highly unlikely. So, and you wouldn't actually explode, you'd just kind of swell up as all of your fluids boil. But, you know, that's okay. <laughs> Low enough probability that you probably don't have to worry about it. Like, just kind of, be, even if you were a sort of instantaneously in a, uh, in a hard vacuum because all of the air molecules were moving away from you, it was unlikely to last long enough to kill you. So, um, anyway. Um, yes, JSON encoding, good, good, good. Um, we'll get to that when we start doing actual input and output. JSON encoding in PHP. So, JSON encode, I've shown you how to do this to be able to print an array from PHP and send it out uh, to the client. What do you think the function is if you are receiving one? Decode. JSON decode. Very good. Um, you're all very clever, which is good, because cleverness is uh, preferable to non-cleverness. Um, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So now that we know what arrays are, we will discuss a very specific type of array that we have here in PHP, which is highly, highly relevant to input and output. Super global. That's right. Da, 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 da. Super globals. Super globals are a set of associative arrays which are created by, PH, by the server in PHP when before the PHP script executes. 
that contain all kinds of useful data. The first and easiest one is the get super array, or super, super global. Get, that is dollar sign underscore capital G-E-T, contains all of the past get parameters. There they are! That's where our input is! If you were wondering where our input is, it's right there. But don't access it directly through the Super Global for security reasons, which we will get to shortly. But I have to show you what it does first. So, does anybody remember how to send get parameters? Tell me. How do you send get parameters? Uh, you can do it through fetch, but you can also do it from the URL address bar. Question, you do question mark, um, I think, question mark. Question mark here, yep. and yeah. the value on the equal to. Yeah. Precisely so. So, just, um, so let's, let's make a new PHP file. Input.php, there we go. It's actually getting kind of hard to type it so dark in here now. For me at least. I don't know. I've got old man eyes. So. So the get super global contains an associative array that maps your get parameters to the values passed. Just to see what's going on with it, and I recommend this as a debugging step if you ever are wondering what values your, your uh, PHP script is actually receiving, just echo it back. Of course, this is an associative array, so JSON and code that Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Where is this? Let me call it. There it is. Jason. Echo. And I have to turn the lights on a little bit. I need just a little bit of light. I, I can't. So. Although that is much worse for viewing. Good grief. Okay, so, let us reload our load uh, input.php. You can see, providing no parameters, get is empty. If I start filling in some values here, Param one equals yes, and param two is equal to Zelda, and param three is equal to um, what's a type of fruit? Eight. Eight. There we go. Although that makes it sound a little bit <laughs> different from. Uh... <laughs> I'm gonna change that. Pineapple. There you go. So there you have it. You can acquire parameters from a GET request using the GET super global. Now, let's examine another case here. The parameter that I just asked, uh, I just, um, I just entered, x is equal to 8, what do you notice about it in the super global? It reads it as a string. It reads it as a string. That is correct. 
Now, this may or may not be a problem because this is PHP. PHP uses weak typing. So equality, if you're checking to see if it's exactly equal to 8, that may work, right? Um, certain numeric operations will work, but perhaps, just for our own sanity, we wish to convert the thing to an actual bleeding integer. So, here's the thing. I have shown you this. Now let me show you how this is bad and wrong, never do this. Alright? You guys ready for a little bit of, let's hack the database? Let's, let's hack the government! Here. Alright. Consider this. Instead of saying parameter 2 is equal to Zelda, let's say that it is equal to script alert you being hacked, son, script. Now, oh. hmm. must have not done it correctly somehow. Why is there an end script there? Interesting. Why is there a two slash? Oh, did I use the wrong slash? I might have used the wrong slash. That would be silly of me. That slash. And it's got two slashes. Oh, did that the voting? Does it automatically like um, print an end script or no? Because it appears that it, it appears twice. Maybe if I take away the semicolon. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I use that. Okay. There's like. By the way, if you see, if you ever see these in a link to an email, run the other way. And where's my backslash at? Backslash, where are you? There you are. Let's see how that works. Still getting two of them. Inserting an end script here. Maybe if I just like leave this off. Mm -hmm. Oh man. Disappointing. I can make it work with post parameters. I'm, it, with post parameters, you kind of avoid the URL encoding problem, which is like what I'm running into here. Um, suffice it to say, a hacker is more skilled than me, 
So we'll be able to do this where, you know, I'm currently failing to. But, so let's talk about post parameters then, shall we? So let's just whip ourselves up a nice little form. Action is equal to input dot php method is equal to post and form input uh, what is it type equals text type equals text is correct yeah I forgot if I need quotes probably need quotes input I don't think you need to close it and then input um, type equals submit. There we go. I think name has to be here. Name is um, username, perhaps. Let's see what we get. Back. Back. There we go. And let's take a look, rather than at the get superglobal, let's look at the post superglobal. Some of the more astute of you probably assumed this, but if you've got one for get, you've got one for post. Note that post and get are being dealt with in two different superglobals, but there is another one, which I forget the name of, which collects up all of the parameters across every different method type. We'll get there eventually. So, if I submit yes, username is yes. If I submit script alert hack the mainframe. And script. Oh, still? Come on. Oh, is it a Chrome thing? It might be a Chrome thing. Let me try it in Firefox. or this doesn't work anymore? Because that's really disappointing if that's the case. What are you trying to do, sir? So, Wait, anything you directly echo, right, yeah. if it contains HTML elements, yeah. they'll, they'll, they'll be put in as HTML. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you get it working? Or? It should work. What are you trying to do? do it? Yeah. I don't know why it's not working for me. Let me try again. Maybe I can do it with like an H1. Hello. Because you can even, like, do you have multiple if, if you like a script. Yeah, there it goes. Super. Yes? Try echoing the value of the user in the except for the whole array. Oh. Oh, instead of JSON encoding. Oh, yeah. It might be because I'm JSON encoding. My hat is off to you, sir. See, it's always, some, it's always me. It's always me. All right. Post, echo the username, name, there we go. Um, or not as a variable, just the gap, yeah, there you go. All right. There we go. Aha. So, um, <clears throat> uh, 
going back to this guy. Should work both places. There we go. So here we go. So if I enter into my little form, script alert, hack the mainframe, submit, uh, without that, I'm out. Thank you. We get localhost 1080 says hack the mainframe. Why does this happen? Remember that PHP is just doing direct character substitution. Just direct character substitution. If you take a look at the HTML source, you can see that the value that's been submitted here, if it's yes, submit, you get yes. If it's no, and submit, you get no. If it's a nasty little scripting attack, it executes the nasty little scripting attack. That's a bad thing. That is a sufficiently bad thing. All right? Um, so, although I have shown you how to get the data directly from the super global, I do not want you to use that method ever for any reason. And you can tell I'm serious because I'm starting to talk very quietly. Like in the real world or for assignments? Either. Consider the, the assignments to be the real world, please. Yeah, no, in the assignments, if you don't use secure practices, I'm going to dock you marks. Keep in mind that you are putting these up on CS Unix, which is a public server. So, you may be asking yourself, how do I prevent this little piece of nastiness from being executed on my, my fair web application? And the answer is, you filter it. Oh. You filter the input. So, do not ever, 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 for any reason, directly print anything that originates on the client's machine, not even cookies. Okay? You do this instead. This is the safe practice. I am holding up my red marker, which means do this or lose marks. All right? This is do this or lose marks, because this is important. You don't do that. You say you create a variable input, or whatever you want to call it. You use filter input, the function. The filter input function takes a number of different arguments. We will go through them in sequence. The first is the type. Uh, it says integer, but it's actually looking for in an enumeration. Uh, the uh, where the data is originating from. So this is a post request. So you are looking for input post. If it were a GET request, you would say INPUT pub, INPUT GET. It's all caps with an underscore in between. Next, you specify the variable name that you are trying to read. That thing. In this case, it is username. Next, you specify which filter you wish to use. Now, there are many, of the, uh, there are many options available. For strings, the one that you should be using is filter uh, sanitize special chars. So there are a couple of different approaches here. Sanitize special chars does something interesting. Let's watch. Reload the page. There we go. Did I save it? 
Oh, I'm still doing it then. <laughs> All right. Instead of echoing directly from the post, super global, echo the variable which you have now filtered. Save, save, save. Reload. Now, isn't that interesting? The script element looks like a script element, but it has not been executed as a script element. Sanitize special characters is an algorithm which searches for special characters generally used in HTML, JavaScript, and related languages, and exchanges them for lookalikes. Right? This opening angle brace is not the, um, the specific opening angle brace character which is used by the programming language. Basically, the one that the programming language expects is the ASCII version of open angle brace, like the ASCII code specifically. This guy is a Unicode lookalike found somewhere in Unicode, and there are like 160,000 Unicode characters or something like that, so there's a lot to pick from. Same thing with the slash. That is a Unicode slash that looks very, very similar to the ASCII slash, but it's not the same character. So, because these characters are, they look very similar to, they print very similarly to the actual real characters that do stuff, but they're not the real characters that do stuff, they just print instead of being executed. Does that make sense? So, that's sanitization. Um, the other approach to that, which is an older approach and not preferred, is, uh, what is it? String, string, uh, I'm going to have to look it up. For a full listing, um, for a full listing of all of the filters, please consult the documentation on php.net. Here you go. So filter, sanitize special characters, email, URL. So email and URL will filter like all characters that do not, uh, that should not occur in a, a URL or an email, right, or an email address. Because, um, you know, the character set is restricted, right? String uh, is the one that, well, uh, it's, it's easier to just show you. Filter, sanitize, and antize. Oh, it gets me every time. String. Uh, you notice that it's got a cross through. You want to know why? Because it is deprecated. Deprecated. Anybody know what the word deprecated means? It's not used anymore. Yeah, it's discontinued, it's not used anymore, they don't want you to use it. Why don't they want you to use it? It's unsafe, it's not current security practice. So, but if we use it anyway. The difference between sanitized special characters and sanitized string Sanitize string removes the tags. 
like it, it's a filtering operation. It's not a character substitution operation. It just removes the things that it thinks are bad. This is less good than exchanging them for things that are safe. Because it could be wrong about the filter. You know, you could trick the filter into leaving enough, enough behind to still be damaging in one way or another. Make sense? So, use sanitized special characters. Yeah, I know. I was just searching for it. So, okay. This thing also does type conversions. Input to filter input input. Let's grab it from get get grabbing parameter x filter validate. So we also, in addition to sanitization filters, we also have validation filters. Validate IP, MAC address, URL, bool, email, domain, regex, boolean, int, float, all kinds of things. Things that must be only a few specific types of characters. This will tell you if they actually are or not. And, as an added bonus, if it's some kind of data type that's non-string, the output will be of the correct data type. So, if we filter validate integer, there we go, and echo input to x is equal to 5. Oh. Uh, you didn't put uh, uh, capital. Yeah, that'll do it. I got lazy. Five. <coughs> what if I enter something like potato? <coughs> I get nothing. So, we don't have too much time left in class, but I will show you this, though we will review it again because it's very, very important. If you look at the PHP documentation for filter input, look at the return values. False if the filter fails. Null if the variable's not present. Present. Um, and Otherwise, it might return zero if zero is a valid, is the, like the thing that was there, right? So let's take a quick look. If input two is equal to false, you should be raising your eyebrows. Echo. Um, X is non-integer. Else, or uh, else if input to is equal to null, echo x was not provided. Else echo, or else if input to is equal to zero, this is an actual correct passing of zero, actually. Else, echo non zero value passed. Remember my semicolons. So, Here's the thing, cats and kittens. Let's say that we call this thing and x is not provided. Oops, it's telling me that x is non-integer. 
What if x is non-integer? x is potato. It still tells me x is non-integer. What if x is a valid 0? x is a non-integer, which is not true because 0 is an integer. And if x is 3, then and only then does it execute correctly. So, for those of you who have been paying attention, what is the problem? Uh, you're not using the strictly type equals. Yes, I'm not using strict equality. Remember, false, null, and zero will all equate un to each other under non-strict equality. You must add the extra equal sign. Just like so. Now, if we add x as missing, x was not provided. x is equal to stupid, x is non-integer, 0, this is a correct 0, and 3 is 3. Yes? Uh, I just used the uh, like exclamation mark to do not x, basically in the first, to see if it's an integer or not. Um, but that seems to result in weekly type. Because, like, we are weekly, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, weak quality. So, instead of doing triple equals false, I just did not input two. Did you use this one? No. I just did not input two. Yeah, that's, uh, that is weak inequality. Not even that. No? I did exclamation mark. Oh. Dollar sign input two. In like this? Yes. That's what I did yeah. in the update. And that results in weak equality. Well, there you go. Well, I mean, the question is, like, what is, what is not 3? You know? Echo not 3. Not 3 is nothing. Well, the idea is, if, it, if I understood the response, the return value, um, if it's not an integer, it returns false, right? Right, and false so, prints is an empty string, so yeah. yeah. Uh, not null is one, by the way. Okay. So yeah. Um, Got it. So no, no easy shortcuts. Use the strict equality. Okay. Any questions? Yes, sir. So we have to filter everything, even if we're just checking characters, not like regardless of how we're using it. You want filter to everything it? every time. Filter everything every time. There's never, there's no such thing as too much security. <coughs> what you are trying to build, and I know, okay. What you are trying to build is a fortress of security. A fortress does not have one layer of defense. You have multiple layers of defense against attack. Because if one layer fails, there are other layers that the attack will hit. This filter input is your first line of defense. We will be going through other lines of defense as we progress through this course. But this is the first and arguably the most important. If you don't do this, you're not doing anything at all. Yes? I was going to say, like, so you said we're going to lose marks for like, filtering. Are you going to tell us like, to what degree exactly what you want? Because so far you just talked about filter like, the input for that one, like getting rid of special characters. Like, so use this work? for strings. Yeah. Use these of the correct data type for non-strings. I have told you my expectations. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. That is actually it. Okay. That's, that's the entirety of my expectations. Use this one for strings. Okay. Use this one for things that aren't strings. Just choose the right data type. That is all you need to know. But if you don't use that, expect to lose marks. I'll hold up my red marker again. Do this or lose marks. Do this or feel my wrath.
All right. Thank you very much, everybody. See you again. See you next week.